Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Levy Lecture. It's my pleasure to welcome you. We have a great presentation today. Jennifer Keishan Armstrong is going to be here talking about her book, When Women Invented Television. I've read it and I think it's marvelous. It tells the story of these four, uh, four women who were groundbreaking in their individual ways, which she will explain. Some uh, of the people, for instance, Betty White is very well known. Uh, some of them are less well known, but they were all just uh, dramatic innovators. And then their accomplishments were kind of erased. So Jennifer's redeeming them. Uh, so uh, we don't really have any uh, big announcements to uh, tell you about. I want to thank the Levy Senior Center Foundation for sponsoring the lectures. Thank you all for your support of the Levy Senior Center Foundation. And um, we're delighted to bring this, these webinars to you. So let me tell you about Jennifer. Uh, she is the New York Times bestselling author of Seinfeldia. Mary and Lou and Rhoda and Ted, which we discussed last year, uh, Sex in the City and Us. She worked for Entertainment Weekly for a decade and has written for many publications, including BBC Culture, The New York Times, Book Review, Vice, New York Magazine, and Billboard. She is an expert on pop culture history. Jennifer, you have the stage. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for having me here today. Uh, as Wendy noted, I got to write about these four amazing women and I love to share their stories with people because a lot of them either are not known at all or as she said in Betty White's case, you know, are this, this part of her career is not as well known and it's really important to me to get their stories out. So that's what we're going to do today and we can do some questions at the end but I'm going to do a little presentation here to kind of give you the broad strokes of of the story that I tell in this book and uh, we can go from there. So women helped to build the foundation of television far more than they've gotten credit for. Um, there is this largely secret history of women in television which is pre-father knows best and even pre I Love Lucy. These women helped to shape TV's early days, but were then sidelined and erased from its history. Father Knows Best uh, came along in 1954. And to me, and I think to a lot of us, this show really exemplifies what we now think of as quintessential 1950s TV. Um, for me, when I think of 1950s television, I think of this, I watched reruns of this when I was a kid, and this is the image I conjure up. It's sort of, you know, it's very patriarchal. It's literally called Father Knows Best. It's very white, it's very middle-class, and it's, it's pretty idealized, right? It's actually a very sweet, fun show to watch. I've recent, re recently rewatched some of it and it was good. I can see why people liked it, uh, but it is kind of that, you know, this one kind of family where everything sort of works out within a half hour. But before that, women actually pioneered much of early television, both in front of the camera and behind the scenes. And today I am gonna share with you some of the stories that I tell in my book, When Women Invented Television, which chronicles how the industry systematically sidelined and erased four women who were among the many working in television's early days from 1948 to about 1955. We will walk through how racism, sexism, and the Hollywood blacklist toppled the promising careers of women like Gertrude Berg here, uh, who was the first true sitcom superstar, 
and Hazel Scott, the first Black person to host a national primetime show. We will also learn how male executives and critics trivialize the work of women like Erna Phillips, who created the longest running drama in broadcast history, which was The Guiding Light, and even worse, how they came dangerously close to ending the career of Betty White. I have to tell you, as a sort of professional TV nerd, um, I had worked at Entertainment Weekly for 10 years. I covered mostly television. I was very interested in its history in particular. I sort of prided myself on knowing it. And even I did not know about these women's contributions until I started, I got a few clues and went very much digging and found these stories. So today we're gonna to celebrate the underappreciated early television careers of Gertrude Berg, Erna Phillips, Hazel Scott, and Betty White. In the mid to late 1940s, radio stars started to migrate over to try out television. Um, you know, everybody was listening to the radio at this time. It was in its prime and, uh, you know, people, that was what people did. This was instead of watching television, they gathered around the radio. And so, you know, that's where all the power and the money was. TV was just getting started. People couldn't have them very much. They were super expensive. And, you know, there was, do, are people having, um, I'm sorry. So, uh, you know, it was, it was very expensive and, you know, most people could not have it. So you might have one on every block or that sort of thing. Um, so this was the time when you could kind of hop over from radio, especially if you had a little bit of, um, you know, experience there, this was the time you could kind of hop over and use those skills to find a whole new niche there. But this was not something that you wanted to do if you were say a man who was in charge in radio. You wanted to stay in radio at that time then because that's where the money and the power was. So women and people of color in particular started making this leap in hopes of kind of snagging opportunities while the white men were still busy running kind of the golden age of radio. And two of those people who did this were jazz musician Hazel Scott, who of course had done some radio, makes complete sense with her line of work, and Gertrude Berg, who had created, wrote, and starred in a sitcom called The Goldbergs on radio first, which was about a Jewish family in a Bronx tenement. I have some people raising hands. Um, I am not seeing that okay. and, uh, I mean, you're fine. I will okay. alert you if there's a problem and we don't use the hand function. So okay. yeah, you're good. I keep seeing it and it's, it was making me nervous. So. No, 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 no. You're okay. good. The, okay. the, the um, slides are working. Everything's great. Great. Um, so Something that's important to know before we, um, we go on with the story is that at this time, this is another thing that kind of came over from radio, advertisers sponsored entire shows. And, you know, this was something they did in radio. So, you know, that was just what they decided to do in television at first. And for instance, you know, Milton Berle's famous variety show which I had always thought before kind of studying this period that it was just called the Milton Berle show, when in fact it was really, it was a couple things, but one thing it was, was Texaco Star Theater. And this was something that was very common at the time is that the shows would even be called, you know, by their sponsors' names, not by their host names or by some cute title. So you can see in this scene, which is like many on the show, Texaco was everywhere. They were not shy about it. 
and advertisers were really, really big. They were in charge. They had the kind of even creative control that we just haven't seen in more recent decades at all. We would think, it, you know, we would be horrified now to hear if the advertisers had this much control, but they were, they would be in meetings, they would be on the set, they had script control, they had everything, which is um, much farther than even the most sort of integrated uh, systems today. Advertisers were very much in charge, they were paying all the bills. And soon enough, the flaws in this system were apparent. And that brings us to the first tactic that the industry used to sideline and eventually erase these women from television history. And that is the Hollywood blacklist. To appreciate the devastating effect that this had, we first have to understand how big Hazel Scott and Gertrude Berg were at the time of their TV stardom. The Hazel Scott Show was the first national primetime variety show hosted by a black person, male or female. We actually, and this is another reason that we don't know her, don't remember her as well, we actually do not have preserved clips of the show itself. Uh, those have been lost, which is crazy. But at that time, a lot of things were lost. A lot of the recordings that they had, they didn't realize people would want to watch later. Um, they barely even had reruns. They, they just did not think, they thought, thought of it as a very ephemeral medium. And so unfortunately, her stuff is not pre preserved. But I read lots of accounts of the show from the time. And uh, they would, you know, a lot of the industry trade publications like Variety would actually review it every week or most weeks and they would describe what was going on in it. And so we do have that and we know what basically went on. And it's that she had a very typical Variety show for the time, especially for musicians. They would basically have a show where they play mostly their own music with their own band. They might bring in a guest or two, do a duet, do a skit, that kind of thing. That was kind of it. And so we can see from this clip basically what her show might've been like a little bit. Hello there, I'm Hazel Scott. I'd like you to meet the members of my trio. We have Charlie Mingus on bass and Rudy Nichols on drums. We'd like to do our version of a foggy day for you. I was a stranger in the city, out of town where the people I knew. I had that feeling of self-pity, what to do, what to do. What to do? The hour was decidedly blue. But as I walked through the dreary streets alone, it turned out to be the luckiest day I So that's Hazel. Um, you can see from that how much fun it is to just watch her play and sing. She's so expressive. She's so beautiful. Um, she's so glamorous. She always looked this glamorous. This was part of her deal. And in fact, the show itself that she did was described as looking kind of like, um, like a penthouse apartment in New York City. It was very, very classy and elegant. And uh, she was getting incredible reviews at the time of her show. It started in early 1950 and it started as um, one night a week in New York City or in the New York area, I should say. And eventually expanded from one night to multiple nights and then from multiple nights to national multiple nights. And 
was really doing well. The reviewers loved her. They kept saying, you know, we need more of her on television. So she was doing great. Um, you can tell so that that something is coming and that it's the blacklist. But um, what, you know, during this brief time when she was on top of the world and had this show and was the first black person to host a national show, um, things were really on the upswing. The Goldbergs was um, no relation to the current show called The Goldbergs on television, um, though, you know, has some similarities in itself because it is, it is very much the progenitor of, of that show and so many shows like it. It was a foundational family sitcom uh, that was, as I mentioned, you know, started out on radio, created, written by, produced by, and starring a woman named Gertrude Berg. And it focused on a struggling family that was proud of their Jewishness. She was really known for her incredible commercial message deliveries. And this was a brand new thing that she was going to do at the time, which was she delivered the um, commercials you know, seamlessly as part of the show, which was common, but she did it in character, which was not something, we just didn't even have that many scripted dramas and comedies yet to even do this. And she had this great idea to completely stay in her character. She wrote all of these herself and, um, you know, worked with her sponsors to make it work for both of them. She really wanted it to be totally in her voice. And I have to say, it became one of my favorite things about watching episodes of the show was seeing how she was going to, you know, sort of land the commercial, how she was going to do it. And the one we're going to watch was during the show's earliest days. And it was kind of its most well-known classic days when she would do messages for Sanka instant decaffeinated coffee. And it was so fun for me to watch these. And I always knew when she first came on the screen, she was going to eventually bring it around to Sanka Coffee. And it was so much fun to see how she was going to do it. So we're going to watch one of these now. I should, the one thing I need to set up for you here is just that this is the opening of an episode where the Goldbergs have just returned from their favorite Catskills resort, which is called Pincus Pines. I think we better go on back. Hello. I, I don't know. Hello is such a little word for such a big feeling. I, I, I want to say hello to you with all with all the letters in the alphabet. That would be a hello. Anyway, hello. How are you? Oh, have I stories for you from Pinker's Pines? But even when you sit on a rocking chair on a porch for six weeks, so you hear plenty and you talk plenty and everybody knows you and you know everybody. And how long does it take to call everybody by their first name? You know, that's why I, I didn't hesitate. When, when I saw the women in the children's dining room getting a little nervous, not nervous because the children didn't, they didn't eat. And in the mountains, you know, isn't if you don't need so you have to pay. And the elderly folks also a little irritable because the mattresses are not so soft like, like they are home. Or the young people, very restless. Why do you mean why they're not restless? Because two little weeks and they want to do everything. So, so they're restless. So that's why I didn't hesitate. The same as I tell you about Sanka. So I told them about Sanka coffee, that it's good for, for, for restlessness and it's good for irritability. And then and, and that's why that's why I, I told them that. And uh, after all, I, those that didn't know, I told them that 97% of the caffeine is removed and you can drink as much as you want and as often as you want because the sleep is left in and it comes in regular, comes in instance. And you know what? Mr. Pink has thanked me very, very much for recommending Sanka and he told me, you know what? confidentially said, you know, Mrs. Wobbles, I, I don't get so many complaints since my customers are drinking Sanka. Everybody likes the service. Nobody complains about the cooking. Nobody says the mattresses is not soft. And he said, you know what else? I really think that the Sanka coffee gets into the disposition. And he says, even if it costs a penny this way or a penny that way, it's non-consequential. Mm -hmm. Will you do me a favor? 
Yes, Will you ask Mrs. Goldberg to change that dress? I can't look at her in the same dress. After all, I'm a dress manufacturer. All right, I will. I don't know, but best is I'm saying it with friends. Me, <laughs> I will, I will. Will, will you excuse me a minute? I have to say to you, to my neighbors. One second, I'll see you again. So that's Gertrude. And um, what was, I mean, there's so many things that were remarkable about her. Um, I love not only seeing how she would you know, deliver this and bring this around to the Sanka, but also just her ability to look right into the camera and make you feel like she's talking right to you. Um, she's so charismatic. Uh, I think it's incredible that this woman started out in radio and was such a TV star. Uh, I think it's so inherent in certain people and she just has that thing. Um, I love watching her and I can see why people loved her and would buy things because she told them to on her show. Uh, it's really, really fun. And she was always talking about with the Sanka, the 97% of the caffeine re is removed and all the sleep is left in. That's one of the sort of catchphrases they had for her. And um, just this was, this was the heights of the Goldbergs and you can sort of see why when you see her. Statistics showed that these two women were among the most popular entertainers in the country. And we can see why having seen it ourselves. And there's no reason to believe that they would not have remained so if not for the anti-communist blacklist, which struck TV in particular in 1950. What happened was um, at this time, a shady group called Counterattack that kind of had um, appointed itself to police the, um, the show business industry for what they believed might be communists. So they published a list of what they called suspected communists working in Hollywood as this pamphlet that you see here called Red Channels. And this was how it would work, at least this time around. I mean, it could work a couple different ways, but one of the ways that the blacklist could work is as simple as this. There literally was a list. This group put it together. Uh, they often even said, you know, we don't know for sure if these people are communists. We just think they might be. And so we wanted to let you know. Um, you know, it's this is why that's not supposed to be how journalism works, for instance. You're supposed to check facts. And, uh, this could do a lot of damage to people, and it did. Um, many of the people listed were early television stars, and especially in this version in particular, this was the first time that these groups really went after TV, which is, I think, an indication of the fact that they knew TV was going to become incredibly powerful. It actually was not quite yet. It, as I said, it was not in that many homes, but it was coming fast. And clearly they saw that this was a chance to gain hold of this industry as it was just starting up and kind of to show the power that these groups could have, um, or at least that they were trying to have. And in fact, it turned out they did have. Many of the people listed were also coincidentally enough, women, Jews, and people of color. And of course, this is not a coincidence at all. Uh, these were the kinds of people that these groups, which tended to be very, you know, what you think, white and patriarchal. And so, you know, they really were very suspicious of marginalized people in particular who might be getting a little too much power in these people's opinions. So a quick and simplified version of how the blacklist worked was, in this case, people were accused of being communists in this pamphlet, and then mob mentality just kind of took its course. That's how this thing worked. It just was as simple as that. They kind of just said, we might think, we think these people might be communists. You do with that what you will, TV industry. And, um, you know, then they kind of let, let that all do its work accordingly. When Hazel Scott was blacklisted, she was listed in this, um, in this pamphlet in 1950, right there and there, and they would usually just like name a few organizations they thought somebody might be involved with, that kind of thing, and then that would be it. And so she was listed 
And her show was canceled merely in anticipation of advertiser boycotts. She actually has an extraordinary story even within the annals of the blacklist. She asked to go before the House Un-American Activities Committee when her name appeared in red channels. This was very unusual. Most people went before the committee only if they were subpoenaed. Often they refused to appear even when that happened. That was their way of protesting, but she had a different way that she wanted to do that. And she demanded to go in front of them. Uh, she was married to Adam Clayton Powell Jr., who was a congressman. And so I think she saw that that might give her a little in. And in fact, it did because the committee really didn't want to see her at first. Um, I think they never really wanted to see her. But um, she applied enough public pressure. She even called a press conference to say they were not allowing her to come. And right after that, she was finally allowed to come. I think they were afraid of her glamour and celebrity. And they said they, they were only allowing it because her husband was a congressman and they were sort of, this was a courtesy. Um, and in fact, you know, she did exactly what they feared, which was she gave this fiery speech condemning blacklisting as a practice and what they were doing as a committee. And um, the, the sort of depressing part of this is that, you know, it doesn't have the ending we wish it did, or at least I know I wish it did, which is, you know, I wish that I could tell you that she gave this speech and then people realized the error of their ways and stopped blacklisting in its tracks in television, um, but that is not how it worked. In fact, she came home from the speech and that is when she found out her show was canceled. Nothing had really even happened yet besides her speech. Um, she was, it was really canceled merely because essentially the network said they didn't want any trouble, even though there really had been not much trouble to begin with. There had been no you know, threats of boycotts or people refusing to watch her show or anything like that. It was just, you know, you opened your mouth in front of Congress and we're gonna go ahead and end your show now. Gertrude Berg um, had a slightly different and more circuitous path to being sidelined here. She, um, her, her TV husband, Philip Loeb, who you saw briefly at the end of that clip, was listed in red channels along with Hazel Scott. And her sponsors, General Foods and Sanka, um, asked her to fire. Philip Loeb, and she refused when they first requested it. For months after that, she worked to try to come up with an agreement with Sanka, but kind of got nowhere. Um, neither side really wanted to budge, and there wasn't much of a middle ground. So the problem with this is that as this was going on, her show was kept off the air, and it was sort of a critical time in its run. You can't just take a hit show off the air indefinitely, especially at that time. It's different now when we'll wait a few years between Netflix seasons. Um, you know, people watch TV out of habit. They knew when their favorite shows were on and this show was not on anymore. Um, nobody knew where it went. And it was right when it was doing its best. It was, um, it had just been made into a movie. It was the first show to first TV show to be made into a movie. That's how successful it was. Um, so it was flying high and then this happened and it was supposed to come back the following season paired on Monday nights with a new show called I Love Lucy. And um, in fact, you know, you know how these things work at that time, it was supposed to sort of help launch I Love Lucy. Instead, Lucy premiered alone. And of course, the rest is history for her. You may have seen, she's really even enjoying a renaissance right now. There are a couple different, there have been, there's a movie about um, Lucy and Ricky. There's another documentary coming soon. That's been something that's been really in the ether again. Um, and she certainly is a legend and deserves that. Um, but it really shows you how Gertrude's life could have gone differently if, if things, if this had not happened. But she was kept off the air for quite some time 
eventually she was able to convince a different network. She had been on CBS and she convinced NBC to take her on instead. But after some complications, it essentially turned out they would only take her if she, uh, if she still fired Philip Lowe. So she was stuck. She either had to give up the show completely or lose Philip Loeb. And um, she eventually decided to give in, she said, because she felt like she was um, responsible for a lot of people who were employed on her show and wanted to, you know, wanted to get them out of limbo. I think she also really did just feel like she wanted to save this creation that she had done actually for 17 years on radio and was now um, just having a second life on television. And I think it was, you know, she, she wanted to keep it going. And so they returned to the air on NBC with um, a new Jake Goldberg. It was one of the first recastings in history, but it never was quite the same as we know happens with recastings. Um, it switched Jake's one more time. She recast yet again, one more time and switched networks a few more times until unfortunately it just kind of faded from memory for a lot of people. And it's important to just reiterate that no actual viewer exodus or boycott ever happened in either case. The networks and sponsors likely would have continued to see great results from both women. Sanka decaffeinated coffee purchases had increased 57% among Berg's viewers when she was doing those pitches for them. The company dropped her with no evidence that her power over her viewers had changed. The corporations made their decisions based on fear instead of facts and likely lost out on business opportunities as a result. Not to mention, I think, the more important and sure thing, which was that they did lose out on the chance to be on the right side of history and possibly even change it. If they had stood firm with Gertrude and said, you can keep this guy, we're not going to, to give in to this kind of pressure, it could have really you know, ended that practice sooner. But this is the way it went. And once again, it's important to remember just how big these women were at the time. That's the part to, to me when I was looking back on history, how was, was the most shocking was just how famous and well-known these women were at that time. Um, Hazel Scott was routinely touring the world successfully as a musician. And she was married, as I mentioned, to Adam Clayton Powell Jr. They were this huge power couple. You can see here's their wedding photo. They were very glamorous. And um, he was also very charismatic and, um, you know, kind of like a great speaker. And they did a lot of sort of civil rights actions together. They would actually plan things together. Like she asked to uh, play at this arena that was in Washington DC run by the Daughters of the American Revolution. And they knew actually that this place did not allow black performers at all. And so they knew she would get turned down. And then they used this incident to uh, draw attention to these kinds of practices. She wouldn't play segregated venues at all. And if she walked in and saw it was segregated, she'd walk out and then call the newspapers. Um, so they were really a team and they were, you know, really glamorous. They were on the cover of Ebony Magazine just as much as they were in the headline, in the political headlines. So I always explain that she is kind of the Beyonce of her time. Gertrude Berg was more like the Oprah Winfrey of her time. Her main occupation was, in fact, the sitcom The Goldbergs, but she had this empire that she built around that persona of the sort of perfect wife and mother. And um, that included, of course, her TV production, as well as a line of affordable house dresses, a popular cookbook, and a parenting advice column, among other things. Uh, the fun thing about both that house dress line and the cookbook is that this is a woman who dressed absolutely impeccably in her off time. She would never have worn a house dress and she did not actually cook either. She had 
a cook at home. She had help for that. Um, but she was always shown in the Goldbergs, just like here, uh, always shown doing something related to cooking, just boiling water, or stirring or moving the eggs around. And so she had this cookbook that she got someone to uh, co-write with her who actually could cook and tell her the recipes. Um, so she was incredibly successful and resourceful in this modern way that, you know, I think we really recognize more now. She was a brand. And this really shows us how insidious the blacklist was. Uh, the side effects really stuck around. This is essentially a story of lost time, opportunity, and momentum for Gertrude Berg and Hazel Scott. That can really devastate a career trajectory and a legacy. Um, that's why many people do not know their names today and definitely don't realize how important their contributions were to early television history. Both of them, you know, essentially lost this time because of their collisions with the blacklist. Both were enormous stars of the time who I think should be as well known today as Lucille Ball. They were both also doing work that would be considered progressive even by today's standards. At the time that Hazel Scott lost her show, she was really reshaping the image of black women on television. She, as I mentioned, insisted on this impeccably elegant presentation. And this is a time when it was still the Jim Crow era. So this was really, really important. Um, I think a lot about the alternate history here and how if she had been able to stay on television and grow in popularity as television grew simultaneously in the next few years, she really could have been in a position where, you know, she had the big show when everybody was watching, which would include people all across the country of different races. And I think, you know, she, Nat King Cole is often um, credited as the first black variety show host when in fact it was Hazel Scott. It's just that she was doing it at this time when not as many people had television. So it's often forgotten. They even had to make a correction at the National Museum of African-American History on the score. Um, so it's, it's just really this fact that has fallen out of the history books completely. And it is a shame and it is absolutely because of the blacklist. Gertrude Berg's show was CBS's top show at the time. So this is right before Lucy comes along on that same network and obviously becomes the top show of everything. Um, and Gertrude's show really depicted an unapologetically Jewish family, which, and they even had like big Passover episodes, et cetera. We would not see another overtly Jewish main character on television until the 1970s with a show called Bridget Loves Bernie, which was about um, a Jewish man marrying a Catholic woman, and that even did not last that long. So now we're going to move on to our two other female TV pioneers um, who offer us a look at an age old method for sidelining and erasing women in every business and especially show business, trivializing the women, their work and their audience. It is the Betty White portion of our show. Uh, Betty White began hosting a national daytime talk show in 1954, which we're gonna see a clip of in a minute. Um, but I wanna give you a little background on what she was up to before this. Um, she had come up through daytime talk. Uh, she was one, on one of the first daytime talk shows ever, ever. And it was a local Los Angeles show. This LA station kind of was at the time thinking, you know, we have to do something with daytime. No one knew what to do during the day yet. It was a lot of hours to fill. And so they hired Betty White and a co-host named Al Jarvis, who was a DJ, a radio DJ coming over. And uh, they put them on the air for five and a half hours a day, six days a week, which is pretty extraordinary. And that was all unscripted. 
they just had to fill that time um, by being personable. And I think knowing that that was Betty's first big job really explains a lot about her future success because she learned to just be there on camera and entertaining people and being really, really comfortable and using her great, uh, her, her really wonderful personality to just reach people all the time, including five and a half hours a day, six days a week. So she was so good at that, that she eventually was uh, discovered by NBC nationally and by 1954, she, um, she had her own national show. We're gonna see a little clip here. It's the Betty White Show from Hollywood. This portion brought to you by RDX, the safe way to lose ugly fat, yet still eat what you want. And Geritol, America's number one tonic that helps you feel stronger fat. Now here's Betty White. It's time to say hello again and start our show again and sing a song or two for all of you. Hi. Happy Monday for you. I hope this is a very extra special Monday for you as it is for us because today is wish day. And that's always extra good news for us. So there's Betty. Um, you can see she was as adorable as ever there. And, um, you know, she even had once wanted to be uh, a singer. So she, she had thought she was gonna be a singer before she discovered the, um, that there were opportunities in television for her. She studied as an opera singer and um, eventually landed here where she did, I mean, even on the, the other daytime show she did, she did a lot of singing, dancing, that kind of thing. Um, I'm sorry, we did not get to see that from her in her later years, because it's really delightful to see here. But her national show really struggled. TV executives were still actually trying to figure out what exactly daytime programming should look like, especially on this national level. And this was the time, you know, this is 1954. So it's four years later than the Hazel Scott show. And, you know, this is the time when really everybody's starting to get television. You know, it's, it's the hot thing. It's all anyone's talking about. There was a, even a song, a pop song called TV is the thing this year. And, you know, those male executives that we were talking about who had been staying comfortably over in the golden age of radio, now we're starting to come over to television where all of the power and the money were. And, you know, because there was money to be made now, they were, you know, messing around with everything that had been sort of working so far on television and basically interfering with these women who had been on television already for several years, who had been helping to build TV in its early days. When it came to the Betty White Show, don't worry, you do not have to do this as an eye test. You do not have to read this. I just wanted to show you that it existed and it was in my files. Um, I will tell you what it says. So when it came to the Betty White Show, the male executives at NBC literally wrote memos to each other explaining that success in the daytime field, as it says here, is, quote, for the most part built on emotional upsets, which seem to interest dames. So this is men writing notes to other men about what they think dames or women want in, in their daytime television. They thought Betty needed to add segments with these, quote, as they called them, emotional upsets that women love. Um, so things like actually something she mentioned, you know, orphans being granted wishes, that sort of thing. And I must admit that does make good TV and it is good anyway, and it still is a staple of television today. So there's nothing inherently wrong with that idea, but um, more to the point, they were not, you know, they were not asking women what they wanted. They were not asking Betty what she thought. They were just sort of bandying about, um, the idea that these women would enjoy emotional upsets. And unfortunately, their ideas did not save the show, which lasted for only a year. 
Something kind of interesting that I also found in the, um, in the archives of NBC where I found those memos was that they were sort of on the right track briefly or on a more interesting track they had this discussion of the 1952 election of Dwight Eisenhower, which was largely attributed to female voters. Um, and this was kind of the first time that anyone really noticed female voters making a big difference. It was, you know, we see this happen with both politics and even things like movies where repeatedly groups like women um, or black people prove that they are in fact a force to reckon with and are important and but everyone is shocked when when it happens and it happens over and over again and we keep sort of repeating this cycle um, so this happened for one of the first times then and these male executives were very impressed by this fact that women seem to have some kind of power they hadn't realized before but then they took this interesting finding kind of in the wrong direction. They understood that they should be catering to women more, but they missed the whole political aspect of that and instead suggested only that they should add more fashion and housekeeping segments, not say political content or issue oriented segments, which this actual fact indicates is what they should have been doing. In any case, uh, Betty's show was canceled and they um, replaced her with the pop singer Tennessee Ernie Ford, who was a man. And um, I guess maybe they thought they could figure out more to do with him. And finally, I want to talk a little bit about Erna Phillips. She created the daytime soap opera genre for radio. She was asked by her boss way back in the 30s, um, make something for women make something so that we can sell them soap, literally um, soap operas. And, uh, you know, she came up with the idea of essentially these heavily serialized family dramas that run every day and leave you on a little bit of a cliffhanger every day. She, you know, was incredibly successful with this at radio. She was making $250,000 a year in the 1940s, and that's in 1940s money. So it is actually $3.7 million a year in current terms. She was incredibly, she was this mogul. She had multiple shows on the air. Um, the New Yorker profiled her. She was a really big deal. And um, she decided, you know, I should be jumping into TV by the 50s. And still, even though she had been kind of almost unthinkably successful on radio, when she wanted to bring her work to television, male executives second guessed her constantly. She actually had to finance her own pilot episodes twice to prove that they would work on television. First, she did it for The Guiding Light, and then she did it for As the World Turns. Now, those are both shows that went until fairly recently. So clearly, you know, she knew what she was doing, but they just could not quite see it. Something that she was really good at and that she was often fighting with executives about is um, knowing her audience. She really appreciated that her audience was made up of housewives. And that meant they had to be able to do work in the home while also kind of watching the show. Um, I think we all have these shows even now that we like to, you know, that we know we can fold laundry or do the dishes or whatever while kind of listening to the show, but not having to stare at it the entire time. It's not some complex mystery or anything like that. Um, so she was always fighting about this with the executives, but um, she clearly knew what she was doing. And I think in this clip that I'm going to show you from The Guiding Light, you can see this at work a little bit, this kind of very explainy, explicative um, nature of a lot of these scenes. <laughs> now, the Guiding Light, created by Erna Phillips. I just 
I can't believe this headline. Daughter of Maida White Roberts held on suspicion of murder. They will say why? One, two, three pages devoted not so much to Kathy, but to Maida. I don't know, Bertha. I, I just don't know. My head is going round and round and round. So you can see that there. And the other thing that kind of was a reinforcing mechanism here is that, um, and I think this is brilliant, the way that she made The Guiding Light a huge success when it came to television is that it had been at sort of the heights of its success on radio at this time with this murder trial that they are talking about, the murder trial of Meta. And um, so what she did is she just seamlessly brought it over to television. She had it so that just one day it started on television and you could see it too. And it would be, you know, recorded both ways. It would be audio recorded for the people who wanted to stick with the radio version of it. And it would also be, um, you know, on video. So you could, it was simulcast. They could, you could choose which way you wanted. And that meant it had to be something you could just listen to on the radio too. And then it just happened to have pictures and people loved being able to suddenly see the the stars doing their favorite soap opera. So something that um, really kind of struck me about these looking at the different cases of these four women is that they had different fates, right? Um, and of course, part of that is that Betty White and Erna Phillips obviously did not experience racism and anti-Semitism to the extent that Hazel Scott and Gertrude Berg did. And that might be what saved them from the harsher fate of the blacklist. Um, Erna was actually Jewish, but she wasn't on screen. So she wasn't like super famous. And um, she also wrote shows mostly about Irish Catholic families. Um, she was based in Chicago for the entirety of her career. I mean, brief, sojourns elsewhere, but she was a Chicago girl. And she knew that um, a lot of the families there at, at that time and really continuing really to this day were Irish Catholics. So she kind of, you know, um, she would use a lot of her own life material in her work, but she just changed it to uh, some big Irish Catholic families instead of a big Jewish family like she came from. There, I do think there's another reason though that the, these two women experienced, um, like kind of survived, I would say, this influx of money and men and power into the industry that forced it into this more conservative lane um, in about 1955. And that is that they worked in daytime television, which was really considered women's realm and therefore less worth bothering with than primetime where Hazel and Gertrude worked. And Erna and Betty went on to uh, quite a bit of success in the, you know, beyond the 1950s. The 1960s really represented a peak for Erna Phillips' career that even surpassed her most productive years in radio. She had a hand in seven shows over the course of the next 20 years, including the long running hit Another World, which she co created with her protege, William J. Bell. Um, similar story for Days of Our Lives. And of course, history proved her right um, in terms of Guiding Light and As the World Turns. Guiding, right, like, Guiding Light ran for 19, or I'm sorry, Guiding Light ran for 54 years, is what I'm trying to say, 57 years. And As the World Turns ran for 54. So that is extraordinary. Betty White, we all know, um, did, extremely well for herself in many of the decades that followed. She sort of bided her time after losing her talk show. She was on a little sitcom called, she had her own sitcom called Life with Elizabeth at the same time as the talk show. And then she was on another little sitcom called Date with the Angels. But the big thing that she um, kind of shifted to soon after this was that she, first of all, hosted the annual Rose Parade, which she loved doing. And she also had a great career in the 60s appearing on game shows. That was the time when lots of 
celebrity guests would be on these game shows and game shows were sort of at their heights. And she was such a delightful presence on camera and was so good at kind of being extemporaneous that she was perfect for this. In fact, met her, met her husband on the game show Password. He was the host. So Alan Ludden, um, you know, so she really kind of like got through the 60s doing that, stayed in the public eye. And then that got her to the 1970s when she took on what for me is my favorite role of hers when she was on the Mary Tyler Moore show playing the happy homemaker, Sue Ann Nivens, um, who was kind of a riff on her original persona as this very sweet presence on daytime television. Sue Ann was not quite as sweet and that was sort of the joke. And then she of course, went on to play Rose Nyland on uh, the Golden Girls in the 80s. And she had this great revival in the last 10 plus years when she hosted Saturday Night Live. She was in Snickers commercials. She was in The Proposal and uh, was on Hot in Cleveland, the, the, which was a very cute sitcom. Um, she got the Lifetime Emmy and she officially has the longest TV career ever, according to the, to the Guinness Book of World Records. So, um, you know, it was very sad to lose her recently, um, but she leaves an incredible legacy and had a wonderful life. She is definitely one of my top inspirations. And something I love about talking about her early career in particular is just, I don't think everyone realizes what a trailblazer and kind of, you know, a feminist icon that she was in addition to being just this wonderful positive pre presence in so many of our lives and on so many screens. So with that, I'm gonna conclude and uh, Wendy can tell us, can, can lead us from here. That was fabulous. I Thank loved you. it. So interesting and just really great. Hang on one second. Let me just. Uh, uh, okay. I looked for gallery view, but that's not coming up. Um, okay. Thank you so much. Um, really fascinating. I'm going to uh, start the Q&A by reading uh, one of the first comments that we received. This is from Michelle Bressler. Erna Phillips was my neighbor when I was growing up. She had two adopted children with whom I played. She was a pioneer because she was a single woman who was able to adopt children. Yes, absolutely. And this was something that fascinated me so much about her. Um, when I was choosing my subjects, there were actually many women working in front of the camera and behind the camera during this time. And that was my original discovery, you know, that led me to write this book, but I felt like I had to narrow it down. And so I made a big list and the list included, you know, it was like what they did, but also I did some research on all of their personal lives. And because I wanted to represent a variety of choices and difficulties and problems that these women would have faced. And I thought, my God, I mean, no matter what, I don't know if it could be any harder than being this mogul of multiple shows and having two adopted children on your own, which also is just extraordinary for the time. I mean, it just, you know, like she had no support. It was clear. And this is something that really comes through in my research and in the book is that, I mean, it's kind of heartbreaking. She had a really, really hard time. Um, and even said at one point that she regretted adopting her children um, because she felt like she had not been able to give them. She was kind of obsessed the rest of her life with the fact that she couldn't give them a father, a father figure. Um, you know, that she wasn't a traditional mother, even though she also kind of argued with herself. She also wrote how much, you know, she, I, I gave them everything that they could have needed and more, but also she just felt like she was always falling short. And I think that's because at that time, I mean, think of how hard it is now. And we have resources for women, you know, like this, whereas there was no support. No one, no one had sympathy. 
no one cared that, you know, she wanted to have her career and also raise her children. No one wanted to help with that. And so it, it just, it, it was really, really hard. And she was extraordinary for what she did. Yes. I was saddened to read in the book that she said at one point that she would give it all up if she could be happily married. That's right too. I forgot about that. That was such a key line. Um, she said that in an interview that she would give it all up for the right man. Um, and you know, that was actually pretty early in her career too. She said that in her radio days. So I don't know if some of this I think can be Betty, Betty handled this and she handled it a little differently, but they always had to play the game. You know what I mean? So part of me wonders how much that was true. Um, she, I do think she really wanted, she, she was very keen on a father figure. She was very keen on having a man in the home and believed in that and said, that was how my parents' marriage worked. But I also always wonder with these women, they were all playing the game. Gertrude was playing to the wifey motherly role that she didn't play at all in real life you know she's putting out a cookbook when she can't cook and you know putting on house dresses to sell them but that is not her deal and Betty for instance would always have to kind of like give cute answers when she was asked why she wasn't married she was single at the time because she had been divorced twice already and she had chosen her career deliberately over her marriage to a man who said he didn't want a career woman as, as his wife. And so she had to kind of be like, well, I just couldn't give a man all the attention he would deserve right now. Um, you know, you'd have to kind of like play that game a little too. So, but I do think Erna really did wish she could find someone and, and could never, but I also think she loved her work and it was a real conflict for her. Are her children still alive? Um, I heard that one of them is, I was not able to find them, but later this happens sometimes with these kinds of books, you know, I was, I've been out talking about it and ran into somebody who had met her son. Um, and it said that the, the daughter was not alive anymore. So that's just completely hearsay. Um, but you know, she just had this really fraught, fraught relationship with them. And, um, you know, they were, I think she had difficulties with them in and of, you know, I think it was just hard. It was just hard for everybody. They were, they were all doing the best that they could. And um, she was constantly kind of beating herself up about it. Yeah, she had a, she had a hard life. Um, okay, let me get to the rest of the comments. Lots of good feedback. Paula said she loved the clips. Jean says, uh, ah, here's a good question. Was the TV show, I Remember Mama, about a Norwegian family subjected to blacklisting? I don't think so, but I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> there were a couple, and I, that one I don't think is one of them, um, but I could be wrong about that. So okay. I, I don't quite remember that one. But I do remember that that show existed. And that's another, I mean, it's another one. It's like, they had to have, the thing about women is like, you kind of have to let them in at some point. Cause it's like, you just need these characters. <laughs> and so you end up with, you know some very powerful female centric roles and shows at, and especially, but right before, you know in that window kind of before father knows best. Okay. Uh, um... Andrea asked, is it true that the powers that tried to, the powers that be that tried to get Betty White kicked off because of a black co-star that she responded by increasing his airtime? Yeah, I know this, I understand this question. Um, so yes, um, so it's very, this is a very streamlined presentation that does not, as you can see, there's so much in this book, it's crazy. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know, I have no evidence that this was part of the reason that she was let go. But one can imagine that it didn't help, which is that she had this, um, she had hired this dancer named Arthur Duncan, who's black. And um, she had loved him from her previous show. You know, they had had him on. And remember her previous show was local. It was Los Angeles. And so they had him on many times. She loved his work. When she got her own show, she thought, let's hire Arthur as a regular. So she did. And 
did get some protests from Southern stations. Now she was national and it was a different, you know, this was the thing about going national is that things got very different because of both real and perceived ideas about who it, who should be on television and what the Midwest and the South like and all of the stuff. This was real. We know this. There were letters um, protesting that there was a Black man on the show. And she did not, she wouldn't take him off because of that. So, um, you know, who knows if that was a contributing factor to her being ushered out of her show, but I'm sure that, you know, everything's a contributing factor in these cases is what I would say. Why, uh, when Lucille Ball and her husband, who was Cuban with a very thick accent, why was that not subject to any of the same kind of scrutiny that the shows you talked about were? Lucy and Desi are such an interesting case. And that is why, like, I was going to say, you could write a whole book, people have, you could make a whole movie, people have. Um, but there's a lot of fascinating things that are almost like, you know, um, contrasts to my four women with her. And um, they had a number of things kind of essentially go in their favor. Um, one was just, they wanted to get her on CBS and you may have seen this in that Becoming the Ricardos or Being the Ricardos or whatever that is movie um, that, you know, she, they wanted her very much because she was a pretty successful radio star by this time. And she was on a show called My Favorite Husband. And they were going to just bring that over from radio like so many of these other shows. And um, she drove a hard bargain and uh, said, I want my husband on the show. This was part, like a big, big factor for them overall was like, the main thing is they wanted to be together in Los Angeles working. This was how it was gonna work because they were apparently having, you know, stress in their marriage. And this was how they were, they were like, we need to be together. We need to be in LA. This is our deal. We're not going to New York like all the other shows, which was what most of other shows did, including the Goldbergs. Um, we're gonna stay in Los Angeles and we wanna work together. And they did kind of the way that this worked out is um, they didn't really get into this too much in the movie, I don't think, but they essentially um, went out on the road. They like did a little tour, Lucy and Desi, to kind of prove that people liked them together. And so they did that and um, the network eventually signed off. It, uh, it was not their first choice at all, um, but this was the way they were gonna get Lucy. And again, it's it's only like 1951, you know, so stuff could still really like they were they were still letting Passover happen on the Goldbergs without a second thought. So it was still a time when there was a little bit of this Wild West feeling that Lucy and Desi get in there. And I will just add, even though this has nothing to do with the question, which is that because it's so interesting. Um, part of the thing about being in Los Angeles is that they had to film instead of being live like all other shows. Shows from New York were mostly live, including Gertrude's, which I think makes it so much more extraordinary um, that she was doing that live. But um, Lucy and Desi being on the West Coast, if they wanted the whole nation to see their show and New York was still the biggest uh, audience by far, they had to shoot on film so that they could send the film to the East Coast to be watched at a future time. And this was very expensive. And it involved some trade-offs in their negotiations with CBS. Um, so what hap ends up happening is they're one of the first shows on film and they end up owning, they gave up a lot of money to both film in Los Angeles, be together and do it this way. And the trade-off was like, great, we'll give you less money, but you can own your films. So do you see what happened? Like they became the biggest show ever on television in history. They're still in reruns today and on streaming. They owned their film. And that is all because part of the reason they could be so ubiquitous in reruns is that they were on film. A lot of these other shows, parts of them are lost because they were live. So it's just this crazy story of both incredible talent and it must be acknowledged that Lucy was a genius with this medium of television, but also just these business decisions that end up making them 
sort of timeless. I think even the fact that he's Cuban makes it feel more modern, makes it feel like something else entirely. And they feel like, a, I mean, they are a real couple, but you know, they feel like this specific real couple. And also even in, as people may have seen in the movie, fighting for things like Lucy being pregnant on the show because she got pregnant in real life. Um, so all of these little things that they fought for, but were also very much business decisions and personal decisions just all worked in their fit in this sort of cosmic way in their fail in their um, favor versus these four women. Very interesting. Um, our friend Mark Larson has a question. Um, Hi, Mark. He says, I'm so pleased you you found and are sharing these stories. Why do you think it's important for people to know these stories today? Um, that's a great question. And uh, a couple of things here, you know, one is, is that there were, there is this sense a little bit, especially of the three who aren't Betty White. It's like, there's a little bit of a sad ending there, which made it so that, I mean, I even had this when I was selling the book, there were people who were kind of like, well, this is kind of a bummer. I don't really want, you know, it's like too bad they didn't get together to buck the system and win. It's like, yeah, I'm sure they feel that way too. Um, so I think that's part of how this gets, you know, forgotten. And I think we still need to know that they were there. I was shocked when, even though I had decided, like I had pitched this as untold stories, right? But Gertrude Berg, for instance, was really, 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 really intrinsic to early television. Like, I don't see how you could miss that. And yet when I got some books to just have some extra research and context, some books that kind of claim to be definitive histories of early television, I went to the back for the index and like, okay, well, I'm going to see if they've, you know, where they mentioned Gertrude, not even in passing, like she just doesn't come up. And I, I've done like, I did a documentary once where I, you know, where I'm on screen and I do expert commentary kind of thing. And they had this really comprehensive list of all the different shows they were going to include. I think it was the history of the sitcom on CNN. And that wasn't on there originally. And I was like, you need to put this on there um, because it just, and it's not their fault. I'm sure it was because they were using the same books I was looking at that they just didn't know. How could you know everything? Um, so I think it's just important people know women were there at the beginning making these contributions. And also these ways that they got sidelined are really, really important. And it's why I make that kind of the focus of my presentation because, you know, this can happen in a variety of ways. And it just shows how it's pretty, you know, it may not be deliberate in the sense that somebody sat down and like made a plan to like, I here's how to sideline women today, you know, but it shows how this can happen. And I think we still need to keep an eye on these, these kinds of forces, especially even the subtler things like the just kind of being dismissive of women's television, you know. Yeah, there's so many things to think about, and and I, 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 it does, it does seem deliberate, um, even though it probably, you know, I can't give them that much credit to have a big strategy, but um, you know, the the idea that memo that you read, um, calling them Danes. And, <laughs> It's actually a little funny just because it's so ridiculous. Like, at least now when you have sexism, it's not as like, you know, obvious people know better. So when I was sitting there, just, you know, you have to, I got a bunch of, mem you know, I got a bunch of files and I was just like sitting there scrolling through one day and I was like, did they just say dame? Like, did they just say dames like emotional upsets? Like, that sounds like a joke of a like parody from Mad Men or something. Do you know what I mean? But it's yeah. really what was happening. And the irony is that he no doubt had a secretary, a female secretary type what he was doing. Right. Like, <laughs> Absolutely. And she's know, being like, oh, what do I, what do dames like, sir? Tell me more. <laughs> um, the whole thing with Molly, um, Molly Goldberg is interesting and fascinating because it's shortly after the end of World War II and all the evidence of the Holocaust has come out. Uh, the state of Israel has been created and to have such an overt program 
that doesn't, that's not embarrassed about Jewishness was, you know, radical. It really was. And I have to say another thing, this is very similar to what we were just saying about those memos in a way, but kind of more touching, I guess, um, is that I read a lot of the letters that she, you know, her fan mail, essentially. And a lot of them were like saying this in a way we would never say it now because we would never write somebody a letter and say like, hey, I used to be racist, but now I'm not because of you. Cool. Like you would never you would never admit it that way. But some of these letters, like they weren't even ashamed and they would just say like, you know, I mean, they kind of couch it like, I didn't used to like people like you. And then I watched your show and I really turned around or, you know, like that kind of thing. And it's so like, wow, like people wrote her letters thanking her for essentially making them less anti-Semitic. And I just don't think we would have that kind of admission now. So we wouldn't have that evidence, but People but really said that. But don't you think the same thing kind of happened with um, like the Cosby show or? Yes. Uh, Absolutely. I mean, this is why this stuff is important. Um, you know, there are people who like to pretend like TV and movies aren't important, that they're just silly and stupid, but especially, in, and that the popular ones in particular are just dumb, but it's like, the popular ones are the ones you have to pay attention to. It doesn't matter if you think they're good or bad or high or low, they're in people's homes. And especially television, the way it's like, you, they're in your home every week in your living room. It was very different from even going to the movie theater and watching a movie once. This was, the Goldbergs were suddenly in your home every week. And, and they you were, were family terrible. events. There weren't right. that many channels. There right. weren't that many, you know, TV went off at a certain time at night. Right. Um, exactly. So they, you know, people gathered around and watched. Yeah. And it makes a, there's studies, there's actual studies that show that empathy goes up just astronomically when you see a group portrayed on television. And so we know this for a fact that, and this is why, you know, people are constantly harping about diversity is because it really, really makes a difference when people see different kinds of people on their screen and are told these stories that make them have empathy for them and make them feel more the same as them than different. It's cheesy, but it's true. So interesting. And it's also fascinating that the corporate executives made the decisions without any statistical, you know, quantitative backup. Yeah, Gertrude in particular is really shocking to me um, because, because she was so big already. I mean, I interviewed this, there's a woman who was in the movie version of the Goldbergs that I mentioned. She was, she played a young woman at the time. So she's quite old now, but she was, you know, a young woman then. And I found her and I interviewed her about the experience. And I loved this one answer. I said, you know, when you went to the movie set to be in this movie, did you know who Gertrude Berg was? And she said, oh, honey, everybody knew who Gertrude Berg was. She said, I didn't even have a TV, but you know, she had been on the radio. She, like everyone, she just was one of those, that's what I'm always trying to like, it's hard to explain. It's hard to impress upon people, but like you need to understand how famous Hazel Scott and Gertrude Berg were in particular. And, and you know, the fact that we don't know who they are now is crazy. Yeah. Jennifer, do you have a copy of your book nearby? I do not, actually. I'm sorry. I am in a different, I'm not at home, so. That's okay. Um, there's a, one of the opening scenes in the book is Gertrude storming into Bill Paley's office. Yes. William Paley, head of CBS, and haranguing him <laughs> until he gives in and allows her to be on TV. It's a great scene that you describe and um i recommend it yes um, um here's the book folks it's it's so readable and interesting and um you know historical but fun so i i just really really enjoyed it thank you so much you're welcome thank you for writing it um Judy wants to know, do you know of other women whose careers were sidelined? 
I mean, there were a bunch of women who I had, you know, I had had this initial list that was much longer. Um, and there were a bunch of them. That was part of the point is I focused on only four because I just had to, yeah, you know, I wanted to really tell their stories. And so, um, and four is like a magic number when you, when you tell stories, no, you know, Golden Girls, Seinfeld, Sex and the City, it's always four. Um, interesting. That's yeah, interesting. It's, like, it's like just enough to get variety, but small enough that you can keep track. Once you go to like five and six, it gets a little unwieldy. Um, so, you know, I wanted to- Friends with six. I know that was, that was, they were pushing it, but they were very pretty. So it worked out. Um, but yeah, like it was, it's really, you know, to tell them in this depth and to get the variety that was why I chose for, but there was a woman, for instance, named Amanda Randolph, who, um, had her own talk show in New York city, I think at least a year or maybe two before even Hazel Scott, she was a black woman. Um, and she's very, she's very fun to watch. She's like in a different way. She's very sort of just joyful. Um, she sings, she talks, she dances. It, it's actually a really funny show. She would, it was a local show. So she just like, she'd sing while like the local pizza guy was like making a pizza on her show. It was like that kind of just really free wheel, wheeling kind of thing. And she had, it was truly part of the first daytime lineup in TV history, period. This, this network called Dumont, which was also what Hazel was on, it was a fourth network, um, had, was the first to have daytime programming. And it was this big deal and Amanda Randolph was part of it. And um, so she was like really, really early. And the funniest thing is that when I was doing some of my research, she was interviewed for this story that someone did saying like daytime programming is a thing. And they, she blatantly just told them like she was getting paid something like $5 a week, which, you know, inflation, it was slightly different, but not still not a lot. And she said, well, for $5 a week, what do they expect? Hazel Scott. Um, so, you know, she, she also understood that Hazel was the queen, um, but Amanda was really fun. And she also was, I believe the first, she was the first like, um, black, woman main character on a show on a sitcom she played a maid on a sitcom um so she, like she was a pioneer in a lot of ways as well um and she was eventually on Amos and Andy so like she had different she made different choices and had different choices from someone like Hazel Scott so I thought she was really interesting too but again I was like narrowing down and there were a few more as well um tell the story about Hazel Scott and the costumes when she was approached about movies. Yeah, she was in movies for a little while. And it was this really weird time in movies. I watched some of these and they're nutty. Um, there were a bunch of these movies where they just make up an excuse to um, have a bunch of musical performances. And so she was like in this pool of people that would be, you know, so for instance, the, the one that you're referring to is called The Heat's On. It's a Mae West movie that's basically about this producer wanting to put on a play that Mae West will be in. And a good chunk of the movie is just people auditioning to be in the play. And so it's just, here's Cab Calloway and he's gonna do a musical number. Here's, you know, whatever. They just have a bunch of famous people. And it was almost like, I think of it as like early MTV. This was how you could see your favorite performers do their thing on screen. And so she was often in these movies and um, had to make really strict rules about her, her appearances because she had standards. And so she had things like wardrobe approval and um, scene approval of her own, like obviously not the whole thing, but like she had to approve everything. And she would never wear a uniform, which I thought, except a military one, which I thought was super interesting. That's her way of not being a maid. Um, she said she would never take singing maid roles. That was her. That was her rule for herself. And um, so she had all of these, these kinds of roles. She could only ever be uh, credited as herself. So it always said Hazel Scott as Hazel Scott. Um, I think again, she was trying to avoid being, some, being cast as something else um, that she didn't like. So she had all these rules, but one, she was on this, this movie, The Heat's On, and she had this number, the caissons go rolling along. And she was in a military uniform. She was in the women's auxiliary uniform, which is very common at the time. And she was playing this song and the, the scene was men going off to war. And um, it was all black men and all black women in this sort of dance number that went along with it. 
And she got to the set and saw that all of the black women were dressed in dirty aprons and they were supposed to be seeing their men off to war. And she said, women would not wear, black women would not wear dirty aprons to see their men off to war. That's just, that would not be done. And so she refused to come to the set until this was fixed, which means they actually shut down for a couple days. And this is like a lot of money, you know, every day of production lost is a lot of money. And so um, that was her last movie that she was in for some time. I believe maybe that was it. I can't remember if she did any more yeah, movies. Yeah, she was, I forget, um, was it Louis Mayer? Um, boycott yeah. her. He said, yeah, exactly. she will exactly. never work in one of my films again. Right. And so that was kind of the end of her time in Los Angeles. And um, cause, cause she just could not get hired after that. And that was, that's another reason why her TV show was, was so, was such a big deal because she had moved back to New York. She was married and had a, had a small child and she was like, okay, well, movies aren't going to work. We're here in New York now. And she got this offer to be in a show that shot in New York, you know? And so it was actually perfect. It was like, she said it was her dream job. It was exactly what she wanted because didn't have to be in LA, didn't even have to be touring. She could just be, you know, a car ride away in the city doing the show a few times a week and could still even play at a club one time a week if she wanted to. So it was really for her, the perfect job. And her uh, son told me that she had said, you know, repeatedly that this was her dream job. So also, yeah, it, it also totally gave her um, creative control just to, you know, relate it back to the story I just told. It's like it, her TV show allowed her to dress exactly the way she was. She was in charge of basically all of this. She had a director, but he didn't tell her what to wear. Um, so she could wear what she wanted. She had her band, you know, it was, she, her son also said that she had said that she loved the fact that, you know, her band was two black men too. So she was like, I love that I am actually like, it's three black people making a TV show here. And, you know, it, it really makes it an extra shame because I think it was like the absolute perfect vehicle for her. And you saw how wonderful she was on screen. Yeah, there, I mean, there's so many great things that you've uncovered and it's also, it, there's, tragedy in, in the truth um yeah. you know they they had very difficult lives and not uh they didn't all end up with happy endings but um the four women have incredible spines and uh did they ever beat one another do you know I don't. If they had, if I knew, believe me, it would be in there because I looked so hard. I would, it would be shocking if they didn't know who each other was at least. And like, there's a bunch of like little connections. I, there's, it's, well, it's pretty sure like Hazel definitely met, for instance, she worked with Philip Loeb, who was the blacklisted uh, TV husband of Gertrude Berg. Um, she played at a club where he hung out with his best friend, Zero Mistel all the time it's extremely likely that Hazel and Gertrude knew of each other and met each other. Um, they were both in New York too, um, both, you know, kind of involved with liberal causes, right. which is what got them in trouble. Um, Erna and Gertrude shared a rep at Procter and Gamble, which was a big advertiser. It was Erna's main uh, advertiser for most of her TV life and radio life. Um, so, and she had a really, really good friend who was also her rep there, was like the godfather of one of her children and stuff. And he also was friends with Gertrude Berg. So like, chances are if Erna came to town, they could have run into each other, you know? So it's like, and I mean, Hazel could have easily even been on um, Betty's show. We just don't know. So like, it's pretty likely that at least, you know, especially Gertrude and Hazel, like they probably all knew, knew who they were. I know that Hazel was a huge fan of Gertrude's show. Um, she watched it with her son. So, you know, it, it's very, very likely that these people cross paths, but I do not have. Oh, and um, Gertrude won the first Emmy Award for Best Actress and she beat Betty. So they were at the same Emmy Awards together. Okay. Um, one final question. Can you talk about your research process? Where, where did you find all this documentation? Um, I, I have to believe that it's more than just public libraries and so please yeah yeah um 
it's more than public libraries, sort of. Um, it's secret chambers and public libraries. But um, you know, I did do a little bit of interview research when I could. So the descendants of people. So I talked to Gertrude's uh, grandchildren and really lucky talked to Hazel's son, which is incredible. He actually visited her on the set of her show and everything when he was five. Um, so he was tremendous. And but, you spoke to Betty. Right. There's only so much you can do with that. So, you know, they still weren't, they, they were kids and they weren't really present at most of what happened. So, um, you know, most of this is archival, which I actually really loved. Um, you can, it's very nerdy. You just like go to archives and sit and page through lots and lots of pages of, you know, Gertrude has her own um, archive up at Syracuse. So that was a multi-day thing of just reading all of her, you know, people wrote these incredible letters then. So a huge amount of this is from letters, memos, everybody was always typing everything. So the, and making it in like triplicate and keeping it in folders. So a lot of stuff existed. And in addition to, of course, things like newspapers and everything, um, there was, you know, Gertrude's archive, Erna has an incredible archive in Wisconsin and that included an unpublished autobiography. Wow. So that's 300 pages of her telling her own story, which is where things like her anxiety over um, her children not having a father really come in. It was very, very honest. Um, Gertrude's were very, Gertrude's files were very carefully curated. Um, she never spoke of Philip, Philip Loeb eventually, you know, a couple years after um, he left the, the Goldbergs, he died by suicide and is kind of recognized as a suicide by the blacklist. And because he, he really was, he was under tremendous financial pressure. He, he was, a, he, he couldn't get work and- um, He had a son that was, um, uh, what was- the, Institutionalized, he, yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, so he was trying to pay for um, this place where his son was, was staying and it just was, and he was very, you know, there was a lot going on for him. So, um, you know, but she, for instance, Gertrude never ever spoke of Philip Loeb's death, period. She actually even wrote an autobiography in which she completely skips it. Um, she mentions why, him. Why do you think that is? I mean, her, her grandchildren said this was, you didn't talk about it. Um, it was, she was my impression of her. And of course I didn't know her, but, um, my impression was her, of her as both very carefully curated. Right. So it's like, this was not part, this was not supposed to be part of the Molly Goldberg story. You know what I mean? The Molly Goldberg story was supposed to be this joyful Jewish matriarch and we make cookbooks and we have house dresses. We don't do sad things. Um, and I think, you know, she had this really carefully curated image and also it seemed like, you know, she loved her work. She knew how to do that. Maybe was not as emotionally expressive. Um, and so I think this just didn't fit with the narrative of, you know, what she wanted her life to be. And so, you know, it, like this autobiography is very cheerful and is just like, aren't I lucky that I had this great life, which is true. She, she is, and she did. Um, but she just, you know, completely skipped over that. And similarly, I could find very little, you know, I found one clue as to where she was when she found out or near it. Um, that he had died, that she was at a meeting at least the next day for her cookbook. That's all I can, that's all I found in like scrounging everywhere. So lots of archival research. Hazel had, um, Hazel's son still had her papers and I was, he let me go through them. They're now being archived at, um, by the Library of Congress, but I was able to do that as well. So there were lots of primary as well as secondary resources, as we say. And I found it really fun and it was fascinating to me to, um, you know, there was also, also things like the NBC archives that where I got that memo, for instance. And it was just- And, they, and you were allowed to go up there and- Yeah, and archives, you know, the way that archives work is they're not, you know, in the main room of the library or anything because they're very well protected because they want to be preserved, they want to preserve them. But, um, you know, you can do archival research. You have to make- a request and say, here's the files I want, you know, all of this stuff. And then you'll go, like I made a special trip to Syracuse and I was there for two days. And you have to sit in the special room and be really careful 
like one time I was in the one did of you have the, to wear gloves white gloves yeah, no no gloves but in one of the New York libraries where I was reading Philip Loeb had written a lot of letters to Zero Mostel so I I did the Zero Mostel um archive there to see his letters and I was sitting there and and suddenly a librarian came up and said you have to put that down I was like what I had picked up the paper from you know instead of leaving it you're supposed to leave it on the desk so that there's no strain extra strain on the paper and you don't accidentally tear it um so there's rules like that um and you have to like you can only bring in pencil and you have to just take notes just crazy i took a lot of some of the places would let you take like photos with your phone if you're careful um but it was it was a lot but it was really fun so worth it yes Jennifer, thank you so much. This was such a fascinating discussion. Folks, here's the book, When Women Invented Television. Um, and check out Jennifer's other books. They're all really good. Thank you. Uh, people will be back in two weeks. We have a fascinating discussion coming up. A professor from Northwestern, Mariam Kuchaki, is going to be talking about unethical behavior, why people are unethical, which I think is just, just what we need right now. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Have a great week. Uh, Jennifer, thanks again, and we will talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.